Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to a game that we haven't looked at for a little while. That game is Civil War General 2. I've been playing a lot of Civil War video games lately, but it's mainly been Ultimate General Civil War, which I think my channel has kind of turned into a quasi-Ultimate General Civil War channel over the last two months or so. But we're returning to a series that we had started uh, just before Ultimate General Civil War came out, uh, that being Civil War General 2, which is a 1997 Sierra game, and in many uh, war gamers' opinion, certainly many Civil War gamers' opinion, it is a classic. It's sort of semi-quasi-dynamic campaign with carryover casualties, units, and promotions, and casualties uh, was a... Uh, sort of a high watermark for Civil War games in terms of linking battles together, and still remains in many ways influential on the Civil War uh, gaming industry. In fact, you can see a lot of things that Ultimate General pulled from Civil War Generals 2 in their, uh, in their newest game, Ultimate General Civil War. With that being said, I'm not really looking at doing a comparison of the two games. We're returning to Civil War General 2 to continue the Battle of Mechanicsville, which we had started in our last video. Uh, the last video we did was looking at the Battle of the Peninsula, well, at, at the Peninsula Campaign, and more specifically, the beginning of the Seven Days Campaign, or the Seven Days Battles. Those battles that were fought uh, in June of 1862, the end of June of 1862, uh, when General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac had marched to within uh, visual distance of the Confederate capital at Richmond. They could see the church spires, they could hear the church bells ringing, and they could even lob artillery, very long-ranged artillery, uh, into the city of Richmond uh, had they had heavy guns in position. Facing General George B. McClellan was Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, freshly under his command after Joseph E. Johnston fell at the Battle of Seven Pines uh, just a month earlier. During that month between when Lee took command and when Johnston was wounded, General McClellan did very little with the Army of the Potomac, readying it for a siege of Richmond, but not doing much to press the Confederates, and as a result, Lee had plenty of time to organize his army and prepare a counterstroke. Lee followed the same tactics that General Johnston attempted to at Seven Pine. At Seven Pine, a portion of the Union Army was cut off on the other side of a river due to swollen rivers and rain. This meant that the Union Army was split in two by a river, and the Confederates theoretically could bring overwhelming force against an isolated portion of the Union Army. Lee would reuse that tactic that Johnston used, except this time he would go north of the Chickahominy River, whereas Johnston struck south. Again, the river was cutting Union forces off, the river was swollen, and General Lee was going to attempt to crush Fitz John Porter's Corps of the Union Army of uh, the Potomac, and in doing so, if he could crush this Union force north of the river, then uh, he could even the odds a bit. The Union Army of Northern, or the Union Army of uh, the Potomac, had about 120,000 men all told, whereas the Confederates had around 80,000 to 90,000 men. They were outnumbered, but it was a vast army on both sides. And the thought was, if they could bring 60,000 men against, you know, some 15 to 20,000 isolated Union troops, they could even the odds for a final showdown battle. In my last video, I talked about the first of these battles that would become known as the Seven Days Battles. It was the Battle of Oak Grove, which also had the alternative name of the Battle of French's Field or King's Schoolhouse. It took place on June 25th of 1862, and unlike the other six days fighting at the Battle of the Seven Days, it was initiated by the Union. It was a Union probing action as they seemingly were attempting to prepare for the assault on Richmond. Uh, it was a somewhat successful attack, which pushed the Confederates back several hundred yards, uh, but did not do enough to delay the Confederates attacking north of the river the following day. Oak Grove occurred south of the Chickahominy River, whereas the Battle of Mechanicsville, the first true battle in the Battle of the Seven Days, occurred north of the Chickahominy River. So this first attack, this first day of the Seven Days Battle, was very much its own affair and very much separate from the remaining six days of fighting that would occur. It's often lumped in, but it's truly not the beginning. 
Now, I already talked about this battle in my last video, and in this video I'm going to talk about the Battle of Mechanicsville. That's the fight you see being fought in front of you, uh, with a much more resounding Union effort than historically occurred. Uh, but the Battle of Mechanicsville is also known as the Battle of Beaver Dam Creek, or alternatively the Battle of Ellerson's Mill. It's interesting that a lot of these Seven Days battles had three separate names. Now, I'll rehash a bit. I know I told you that the Union Army was cut off by the Chickahominy River. What Lee was planning to do was bring General Jackson in, who had just freshly arrived from the valley, as well as some 60,000 troops of his, swing north of the Chickahominy River and crush the Union force. Jackson was to come down on the exposed Union flank uh, near Mechanicsville and crush Fitz John Porter's army. The military situation after the battle or leading into the battle, uh, called for Jackson to begin the attack on Porter's northern flank. A.P. Hill was to advance from Meadow Bridge when he heard Jackson's guns. Uh, and then General James Longstreet and General D.H. Hill were to pass through the town of Mechanicsville itself and support Jackson directly, as well as A.P. Hill. Lee was kind of hoping that Jackson's flanking movement uh, would force Porter to abandon his line, and then that both A.P. Hill and Longstreet, who were coming up, as well as D.H. Hill, who were coming up more on a direct frontal line, wouldn't have to launch a frontal attack. So, again, Hill and Longstreet were coming up, both Hills and Longstreet were coming up to attack sort of the front of the Union Army with its entrenchments, and Jackson was coming up around the uh, Union flank, and the idea was to use Jackson to force the Union out of their entrenchments. Then Longstreet and both of the Hills could pursue in more open fields and destroy, damage, or at the very least turn the Union forces out of their positions once they were out of their entrenched positions. It didn't quite work out that way, however, because General Jackson, his forces, never showed up. Jackson's men, it should be noted, had just concluded a month-long campaign in the Shenandoah Valley, which I think we'll probably touch on in later videos of Civil War General, because it does uh, give you the option to fight the valley battles. But Jackson's men had fought a month-long campaign in the valley and were showing up to this battle basically without pause. They were exhausted and they were slow. So Jackson's men were running late. They were more than four hours late, and at around three o'clock in the afternoon, A.P. Hill grew impatient and decided to attack the Union on his own. A.P. Hill had around 11,000 men, and he launched a frontal attack against Union General George McCall, who had a Union division at the front of Porter's forces. Despite being launched as a frontal attack against a uh, well-entrenched position, the Union were forced back because A.P. Hill's division was rather large. However, they were able to regroup, and Porter sent up reinforcements uh, to stem the tide. And then, from there on, Hill launched a series of frontal attacks against still well-entrenched Union troops uh, with dozens of guns, and just frontal attack after frontal attack that the Union beat back with ease. Uh, it was a rather poor affair in terms of military tactics, with the Confederates launching continuous frontal assaults. L Jackson's men, initially slow, then became lost, couldn't find any of the relevant commanders, and then Jackson just kind of sat down and just let, you know, they could hear the battle occurring, but they just sort of sat it out, if you will. Uh, Longstreet uh, ended up supporting, but not quite as vigorously. It was really mainly Hill and about 5,000 other troops that the Confederates were able to engage. Instead of Lee being able to bring in some 60,000 men of his, uh, he was only able to bring some 15,000 men to bear uh, against roughly equal Union forces. The Union lost about 350 men. The Confederates lost over 1,400 men in this first battle of the seven day, well, first of the major battles of the seven days. It was clearly a uh, defeat for Lee. Uh, his orders were not entirely clear. It was somewhat of a complex plan in terms of which units were taking which roads. Uh, he was relying heavily on an exhausted force that had no time to regroup and was going straight from marching into battle. It was a bit of a debacle on all sides. 
Um, despite the fact that the Union attacks were, or the Union defensive was able to repulse the Confederate attacks on June 26, the location of Jackson's force on the exposed flank of Porter caused Porter to need to pull his forces back uh, by June 27th, the following day, uh, when the Battle of Gaines Mill would take place. So, so even though Lee was unable to actually push Porter and the Union Army from their positions, uh, this open flank of the Union was recognized as a threat, and uh, McClellan ordered Porter p to pull his corps back to a more defensible position. He essentially he refused his flank uh, out toward Old Cold Harbor and just south of Gaines Mill, which would be the major action of the following day. Uh, so it wasn't entirely a failure in the sense that Lee's frontal attacks were thwarted, uh, but at the end of the day, his desire to have the Union be forced from their positions and to pull back out of, uh, out of their strong defensive works there was successful, although at a disproportionately heavy cost for his forces versus what the Union gave up. Nonetheless, the battle was a failure. It was a tactical Confederate victory, uh, and or sorry, a tactical Union victory, uh, with the Confederacy uh, losing fruitless troops in ill-coordinated and unsupported attacks, uh, with the command and control breaking down. And this was sort of one of the early examples that would become more and more prevalent as the war went on, uh, or as the campaign specifically went on, that Lee needed to look at reorganizing his forces forces because this whole division in his army at the time of the battle was formed into large divisions under Huger, Magruder, Longstreet, A.P. Hill, D.H. Hill, uh, and Jackson. Uh, so I think it was like six or seven divisions that Lee had north of the Chickahominy River launching these assaults, uh, and it was a bit of a clunky affair. Uh, it was interesting if you look at the later battles when uh, Lee decided to promote Longstreet and Jackson to Corps Command, how much more efficiently the army moved than it would move throughout the seven days. That really is a story for another, another video and another battle, but it is worth calling out that the seven days battle in many ways was this dress rehearsal for the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, and it was just fortunate that General McClellan was the one in command so that, you know, repulse after repulse turned into Union defeats, despite the fact that the Union were constantly throwing Confederate attacks back. Uh, the Union were defeated in their mind during the Seven Days Battles, and as a result, the Army of Northern Virginia was allowed to survive, Richmond was not captured, and Lee was allowed to apply the lessons that he learned at the Seven Days to great effect in later campaigns, starting almost immediately with the campaign at Second Manassas, followed that up with, you know, still success at Antietam, despite the fact that, you know, it wasn't a dramatic Confederate victory, and then you continued to see Lee use his uh, successful wing structure of his army through Chancellorsville, uh, and uh, Fredericksburg uh, before it. Uh, so it's it's an interesting first example of uh, Lee trying to, you know, fight with the, the army structure that he had in place, only to realize that what he had wasn't ideal uh, for the type of war he was trying to wage with the subordinates that he had at his command. With all that being said, Mechanicsville is pretty straightforward. It's a series of Union attacks, or Confederate attacks, I keep screwing up these names, I'm sorry guys, a series of Confederate attacks against entrenched Union positions uh, that forced them to fall back somewhat, but allowed them to reform, uh, and led to another battle, a mar far more consequential battle, the following day. It sowed the seeds for Gaines Mill, uh, but not much else. And in the grand scheme of things, about 2,000 men on both sides being killed, wounded, or injured made this somewhat of a skirmish by late war standards, uh, although at this time it was still considered one of the, you know, the larger battles of the time uh, that would certainly pale even just a day later to the Battle of Gaines Mill. The Seven Days Battles are another, there's another interesting piece to these battles, and I, I know I'm kind of rambling and, and going off topic, but given the fact that we've covered the Battle of Mechanicsville to the point that, uh, that we can without starting to delve into Gaines Mill the following day, the Seven Days Battles are interesting to me because they're an example of battles where a portion of the army was engaged and the other portion really had no clue what was going on. Uh, I've been reading... Uh, the books that are written by uh, Bruce Canton, uh, who's kind of 
Shelby Foote gets accused of being a bit of a Southern sympathizer. I think that's certainly somewhat accurate in his Civil War histories. Uh, but the Union has, ha and there are a lot of Southern sympathizers throughout uh, Civil War history in the United States. Many authors, the whole Lost Cause movement, there certainly is a cause to say that there are many writers out there who write with a Southern bias. But there are also authors who write with a Northern bias. And Bruce, I think his name is Canton, uh, is a perfect example of that. He wrote a three-volume history of the Army of the Potomac, specifically. He also wrote a three-volume history of the Civil War, and he also wrote a uh, a couple of books, I believe, about Grant or you know Grant coming east or west or whatever. Uh, but but he wrote a three-volume history of the Army of the Potomac, where he specifically looks at that army. And I'm reading the first one of these, and these are books that are written back in the 50s and 60s. So I mean, these are certainly uh, classics, in my opinion. They're, they're a different writing style than we see in history today. They're very narrative-centric. Um, they almost read the initial scenes in, the, in uh, Mr. Lincoln's Army, which I believe is the first book in the series, which is what I'm reading now, um, reads almost as if it's like a, a novel. The opening, the opening uh, chapter is this, you know, very graphically de described scene with, uh, you know, General McClellan, this uh, young yet weary uh, officer with the trappings of power and, you know, uh, dark lids under his eyes coming up the river on a steamboat and, and going to his tent and, you know, Herman Hopped, I think it was, the railroad attendant who's in charge of the Union Armies of the Railroad, comes to him with this novel plan to reinforce the army that, you know, is out of contact with with McClellan and, and has uh, been engaged with the Confederates around Second Manassas. And uh, the railroad ties have been cut uh, thanks to General Jackson's raid at, at Manassas Depot. And uh, the railroad officer comes up with this ingenious plan of sending railroad cars down with troopers on board. It would end up being Hancock's boys who would be involved. And just the pageantry and the way that he goes about describing the scene is is very much, again, as if it was being written by a uh, fiction novel. But, um, you know, so I, I certainly I find quite a bit of enjoyment in reading this book. But the reason I'm bringing it up is more to talk about, uh, he talks about the seven days almost in passing. So um, he the way he talks about the fighting that occurred at the seven days from the perspective of some of the, the soldiers involved, is the army didn't know what was going on. It was almost, you know, there's fighting going on, and there's rumors of victory and rumors of defeat, and, you know, and uh, what have you. And I thought that was fascinating. And Lee's, uh, defeating Lee, with the second corps of the Army of the Potomac, the book I reviewed a little while ago, kind of had a similar perspective, where it's like this corps wasn't involved. So to a vast percentage of the army, the seven days battles, the first three days of battles had nothing to do with them. The first day you hear fighting going on and, you know, you don't know what's going on. You just hear musketry as it's increasing in intensity in the northern section of the battlefield. But only one corps is engaged. You know, if you're on the southern southern part, if you're at Sumner's Corps, Heinzelman, Keyes, Franklin, none of their corps are engaged. And yet intense fighting is going on and you don't know what's going to happen. And then a second day of intense fighting is going on, musketry raging in the north, and orders come down late in the day to retreat. You don't know why. You're not certain. All you know is you've been told to retreat. The army must have been beaten, but how could it be beaten? You didn't see a single rebel all day. And yet, you're pulling back. You've been bested. Well, sort of. I mean... That portion of the army, yes. But it's fascinating because the Civil War, you think about it, if you think about the Revolutionary War, the armies involved, the scale of the combat involved is so much smaller to the ordinary soldier, to the American soldier. They probably, and again, I haven't read a ton of Revolutionary War history, but you don't have these vast, sprawling battlefields, to my knowledge, that you have in the Civil War. So the odds of having, you know, half the army not feel beaten when it might be the entire army might be the size of like two brigades, that's probably not going to happen, right? But in the Civil War, you know, you look at the, the Richmond campaign where the front stretches for miles. 
and rivers are crossed and units are here, units are there, cores operate on their own, and sometimes you're not even engaged and it's a disastrous defeat for you. The Fitz, was it Fitz John Porter's Corps uh, that was held in reserve and Franklin's Corps as well, held in reserve at, uh, at Antietam. Most of the army, 70,000 men engaged, bloodletting like none other, and yet 30,000 men stay out of the fight and do nothing. The last reserve of the Army of the Potomac is not committed. And so this singularly bloody and devastating experience for the vast majority of the Army, or for a large percentage of the Army, holds no sway, no meaning, no uh, victim to a third of the Army of the Potomac. And what effect does that have when we view history well, we hear about the regimental histories of the soldiers that were savaged in the battles, but we don't get a full picture necessarily of what that was like because we ignore the soldiers who weren't engaged. We assume this singularly awful and uh, heroic and uh, you know devastating experience for uh, these soldiers in combat was the story of all the soldiers, and yet it wasn't. It was just a fraction. I don't know where this where this ramble was was going. Um, I wasn't. I guess my point was that uh, Canton does a, a good job, I think, of talking about the seven days, but he also does a good job of weaving in personal accounts, and it helps to tell the story of how the defeat, while seemingly substantial to northern uh, journalists and northern citizens, you know, hearing of the army's reversal, the army after the seven days wasn't beaten. They didn't feel beaten. Maybe portions of it. And, and maybe that, that's a, a more appropriate discussion to have later on once we get through the seven days. But the army didn't feel as if it had been bested. Porter's Corps had to pull back after Mechanicsville. They'd have to pull back again after Gaines Mill. Heinzelman, Keyes, Sumner, Franklin, all their corps had to pull back and they weren't even engaged. Tell that, tell that to a soldier. You lost a battle. I didn't even fire my rifle. Well, you lost it anyway. Okay. What does that What does that do? I, I, I kind of wonder, you know, McClellan as the commander of the Union Army of the Potomac was beloved by his soldiers. He was hero-worshipped. And it seems that in a lot of his fights, in, in the Seven Days Battles in particular, such a small percentage of his forces were engaged, it's easy to be, you know, uh, thinking highly of your commander who's got all the flowery language and saying, we pulled out, we saved the army just in time, and you think, great, well, I didn't shoot anyone or get shot at, but he's telling me we got saved, so we must have done something well. Or, you know, he must have really been looking out for us that he didn't sacrifice in, in fruitless frontal assaults. Um, and you can say the same thing, you know, at Antietam, a portion of his army was committed, a larger portion, but a, a substantial portion as well was not. So, I don't know. I mean, it's just the musings of a fatigued man, you know, it's in the early a.m. and I'm kind of talking and I, I plan to talk more about Mechanicsville, but frankly, it's a pretty straightforward fight. It's a short fight. It's only a day long. And uh, the fight right now... In, in in Civil War General 2 in front of you is, I don't know, somewhat one-sided. The Confederates are being held back easily and have driven them, driven them back more than they've driven forward, and we're winning this battle for sure. You can see here as we kind of click through our units, we just pushed back a Confederate unit. We're kind of turning the Confederate left uh, and, holding on our, and holding on the Confederate right. Uh, there's still substantial enemy forces here, but you can see we're pushing them back somewhat at ease, and I guess that's just, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't have a ton to add here, but I also don't want to just cut out the video. What I would say is that one frustrating thing, and you may get it in this series, and it's one of the reasons I stopped streaming it after a little bit, is the battles get pretty darn repetitive. You know, it's not... You don't have this unique ridge. You have to figure out how you're going to maneuver around. There's no uh, desire to, you know, find cover. It's terrain has different perks in this game, but the tactics of combat are kind of non-existent. 
So the game gets pretty repetitive pretty quick. It's like Panzer General, except if you had every unit as either artillery or infantry. Make the game a little bit less interesting. Anyway, um, I think that's probably going to do it for my rambling at this point. Um, I'm going to kind of jump ahead in this battle. We've won this battle. There's only a few more minutes left uh, until the fight is up. So I think I'm going to jump ahead to the end of the battle and uh, just kind of talk about the results since we've gotten through mechanics. Well, I'm sorry if this was a kind of a disjointed video and, and not quite as entertaining after the first 10 minutes of history being done. Um, I'll, I'll think about how to approach the next fight because some of these battles are kind of long. I could edit portions out. I may do that. Um, but anyway, guys, thanks again for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed. Let's go ahead and jump ahead to the casualty screen. All right, you can see here the Confederates historically lost about 360 men. Here they lost 577 killed, 1,200 wounded. So more than five times more than what they lost historically. Meanwhile, the Union lost about 1,400 men historically. Only lost about 900 here. So the Union was about 500 men less. I also forgot the Confederates here had 1,600 men surrendered. So at the end of the day, the Confederates lost some... 3,000 plus men to the Union's less than 1,000, uh, almost the exact opposite of what happened historically. Meanwhile, General John Sedgwick uh, was uh, wounded or, or is granted furlough after being wounded. His health is in recovery. Uh, and we had a couple of promotions of some minor figures. I never know how promotions really carry over. It's somewhat difficult in the campaigns that span both East, both east and West Sometimes commanders are hard to follow if really their promotions matter, if they end up where they do historically. You know, it's it's not always that obvious. Um, and you can see here we came out with $79,000 that we can use to re-equip troops and make them more effective. This has a very ultimate general feel to it in the way that ultimate general civil war handles rearming troops and improving their weapons. And this is all uh, very, very similar. And I have to wonder if they took some... Uh, you know, I wonder if they developed that in a vacuum or if they saw this and they said, hey, let's model this and, uh, you know, kind of go from there. Anyway, guys, this was a little bit of an experiment that I'm not sure it worked out all that well. Um, I think the previous video actually did really well in terms of my historical narration, but I think Mechanicsville was a little bit too short of a fight to cover in just or to cover in 30 minutes. Um, so I may tweak things going forward. Maybe I'll mix some historical commentary in with actual gameplay commentary. We'll see. I'm not going to bore you while I kind of fiddle around with rearming and maxing out my forces. So it's suffice to say that we won the battle Mechanicsville, uh, crushed the Confederates, and we await the Confederates' uh, next attack at the Battle of Gaines Mill uh, here in our next video at some point when I get to it. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. I'm going to go ahead and sign out. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.